All right, thank you all. So we are gonna continue the conversation with our partner, Valent Biosciences, and around the role of outdoor mosquito management. Um, saying, I, I live in DC where mosquitoes are my, my arch nemesis, so I'm really excited to have this conversation. I would love to invite Jason Clark as Manager Director for Global Public Health and Forest Health at Valent Biosciences, and Silas Majambere, who's the Business Manager at Valent Biosciences, to the stage to join me. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Great, so we are going to talk a bit about how to control mosquitoes that isn't just a lot of the conversations around mosquito control, particularly when you think about malaria prevention, is around how to do like individual protection, right? So it's sprays and, and bed nets. And what you all are doing is really encouraging um, to look beyond that and broaden the conversation to include outdoor mosquito management. And Jason, I'd love to hear kind of what is driving this need and what are some of the environmental trends that you see that might even be exacerbating this and why you would encourage us taking this broader holistic view of mosquito management. Yeah, uh, since 2000 and the start of the Millennium uh, Development Goals, uh, as you had mentioned, a lot of the focus, 90% of the malaria burden is in Africa. And so when we talk about malaria as a global community, we're really talking about the continent of Africa. And so over the last 25 years, most of the focus has been on the vector side to treat uh, the mosquitoes indoors. Uh, the premise being that uh, the major species of mosquito that transmits malaria in Africa uh, likes to bite people indoors. And so therefore, let's focus these limited dollars on interventions that are indoors, such as sleeping under uh, insecticide-treated mosquito net or uh, indoor residual spray and just that focus. Unfortunately, that uh, doesn't take in the whole life cycle of the vector itself, number one. And number two is, uh, what's happening is the biology of the mosquito uh, is beginning to change in terms of their behavior. So even that same species that at once only would bite people indoors is changing and biting people outdoors, um, changing when they bite during the day, right? And then there's also invasive uh, mosquito species that can uh, transmit malaria as well that are coming in that are just naturally like to bite people outdoors. So if you're sleeping under a net, that's not going to help if mosquitoes are biting you outdoors. And so uh, in Africa, uh, there needs to be a shift, which is what has been done in many countries around the world that have eliminated malaria, is recognizing that it's a complex problem. Um, you have to manage the mosquito holistically um, versus just focusing on one disease. So. And so we actually had a, a podcast episode we recently did with you all on this, so a little shameless plug for that in our This Week in Global Development podcast, this a special edition episode. And, and Silas, you talked about you know, this source control um, as being an, an old but forgotten principle and you know, one that you think was a, a, abandoned by seeing a resurgence. And what do you think it will take to get this you know, reprioritized on the African continent, which as Jason says, has such a, a high burden of malaria. Yeah, thanks Kate. So I think what it will take is what's happening today. Um, all the shifts in terms of funding, uh, or the realization that um, we've been on this for the past 30 years. Um, and if you see all the statistics, they tend to go back to 2000, which is 25 years ago. Um, and we, we saw uh, progress in those 25 years ago, but for the past 10 years, we have not seen any progress. Um, there's some resurgence, and I have to uh, perhaps clarify here that um, although what's happening today in terms of uh, disbanding of USAID and other things that are on the radar today, that's not the primary cause of the stall uh, or lack of progress in malaria control. It's not that, neither is it COVID. So the, the, the lack of progress was starting to be seen seven years ago, eight years ago, almost 10 now. So that should make us stop and look, uh, like what's not, what's not happening? What are we not doing well? 
And that's one thing that probably should help. The second thing that should help is to, I hope people can still look back and see what has worked elsewhere. Um, here where we are in the US, you had malaria before. Uh, malaria was a serious problem. And the time you started um, controlling malaria, around 1900, um, some counties in the US had an economy that is less than what we have today in Africa, in some countries in Africa. Um, technology was not there. Um, there's, there's a lot that has happened in the past 100 years. Um, so looking back and knowing that it's been done elsewhere and then checking what are we not doing the same way or at least better in Africa should help us change. And one of those things is outdoor mosquito management. We, we don't know any country that has eliminated malaria because of using bed nets and IRS alone. But we know countries that have eliminated malaria focusing on outdoor mosquito management, environmental management, house modification. Those things we're not doing in Africa. Yeah, so you know, this is, a, I think, a really long-term approach to mosquito management. And Jason, you talk about the difference between control and management. And, and you know, what do you think it would take to get policymakers to shift their view from just focusing on those short-term intervention and more of this longer-term management yeah, I think you need to start with integration. So much of the conversation over the last 25 years is focused on the disease, and rightly so. Just, I mean, we have 600,000 um, people that die every year from malaria. Um, you're having, and 90% and of that is for children under five years old, and so you're having a child die every minute. That's a crisis. So it's very much placed appropriately, but with limited funding and limited resources, you get the policy conversation started by saying, how do we make our dollar go further. And so if the conversation is only about malaria, then you're only focused on those malaria-centric programs. But if you talk about every disease that mosquitoes transmit, mm -hmm. that's a lot broader discussion. In fact, more people are affected by all of those other diseases outside of malaria. Like I said, 90% of the burden is in Africa. But if I start talking about dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya, Zika, then all of a sudden, I'm now, uh, I've got four billion four and a half billion people. And so that's how you get the policy conversation, I think, really started. One, two is uh, the policy conversation needs to shift to model what Celis had brought up in terms of where, are, where have there been successes? Mm -hmm. where, we're talking about here in New York City, it was the first uh, recorded actual organized mosquito control within the United States. It actually happened right here in New York City. Um, again, that was 1901. And so, uh, you know, Africa is almost kind of in that starting place, except they have better technology, better tools, more money, uh, you name it. And so if we can look at countries where there's been successful on the outcome side, I think you can get the policy and the politics to cycle behind it. But you, you've got to start the conversation with how can we be efficient? How can we integrate around the mosquito, not just around the disease. Once you start having that conversation, it just opens up you know, your ability to be able to move forward in, in a broader way. And Sela, so how are you, what challenges are you seeing from, you know, it seems like everything's there to know what to do, but what are some of the roadblocks? Who are some of the stakeholders you're bringing in? Maybe talk a little bit about the role of, of different partnerships in having an integrated approach to mosquito management. Yeah, I think there will be a lot of education to be made. Um, education everywhere, uh, to the funders, to the governments uh, in Africa, to the people there. Uh, th the reason I'm saying and focusing on education more is you will find a lot of very bright PhD level um, Africans who are trying to do something about malaria but we all funneled in the same channel. Um, it's commodities that we deliver to the communities and then we wait for the commodities to come back again and then the cycle never ends. But to, to get into a real serious mosquito management program, it has to be beyond dropping down some commodities. It has to be a, a Population, it's not rocket science. Um, if, if mothers are educated, children are educated that the mosquitoes are coming from the potholes around your house, 
you will know what to do about it, and you'll be helped for what you can't do. So, uh, and we have a lot of experience here in the US and some other parts where these things have worked. So um, partnership will perhaps start with educating what do we need to do and understanding this is not something impossible. With the money we have today, with the education we have today, with all the experience that we have behind us, we should be able to do proper mosquito management in Africa. It, it should be able to be done. Um, it's a change of focus, a change of um, the way we think. And uh, perhaps on, on, the, on the partnership level, let's start at the base. Let's start at the community level. There's a lot of money flowing into Africa. Um, so we like to say that there is not enough money, but um, wherever you go in the most remote place in Africa, you'll find a mobile phone. And it's not cheap, and it's not handed over by some donor. It's bought. So um, there is money, but it needs to be focused, and the priorities need to be set properly. Governments have to step in and take over this health issue. It can't be outsourced forever. Uh, governments have to rethink, and they will find partners. They will find partners who can work with them. Um, I think we don't have an issue of partnership. We have a, an issue of focus and priority. And Jason, we talked a bit about you know, the challenges of you really need a local context, right? A, a solution that's locally relevant. But also, you want a national plan, and mosquitoes don't necessarily know borders, and maybe in regional plans. And so, how do you think about driving that coordination at that national level, but also ensuring that solutions are locally driven and you know, fit for purpose in that local context? Yeah, I think um, just to be practical, you know, there's kind of the pendulum is all the way this way where everything is just managed at the national level and they're the liaison with international donor money. And then there's just kind of the thought process around, let's say, the, the, the individual city or the village level at a community. And the way it's been successful uh, around the world in terms of not just managing and eliminating malaria, but mosquitoes is kind of that this mid-tier so just to use an example here in the United States, mosquito control is managed across 1,200 to 1,300 mosquito districts, which are all government-based, but are in this mid-tier. So they're at a county level or they're at a state level, more provincial level. And so uh, that mid-tier group has the ability and the scale to be able to manage across the region, but then are localized enough to understand the local ecology, which is really important as it relates to outdoor mosquito management. So I think sometimes people talk in extremes and really the solution uh, rests there. And what's been able to be accomplished for um, the United States, 340 million people uh, is done very efficiently. Uh, approximately 600 to 700 million is spent on the operating budgets for governments around the United States to manage mosquitoes. That's it. <laughs> I mean, and then you could scale that and create more efficiencies when you go to developing uh, places like Africa or even in uh, uh, South America and Asia. So I think finding that, that tier that is able to address things so you can drive policy at, let's say, uh, a national level, but still understand the local ecology is where uh, you need to start, so. And so let's, how would you say that you know, climate is making this an even more urgent or complex issue to address? Yeah, so I think some of you will have seen in the news um, the floods um, in Mozambique, for example, um, or even crisis wars that displace people and then malaria kicks in. Um, so climate um, will always be changing, whatever we do. Um, but res building a, a resilient system uh, within governments, within communities, is, is the only solution we can have. Um, there's a lot of tools that are available for um, cases like that. But if you, to zero in back on, um, on the subject of the matter today, outdoor mosquito management, when the floods happened in Mozambique, um, you would think the first thing people will do is to go out and spray that massive water body that is there. Uh, with There's a lot of good products out there. That didn't happen. Um, what happens is, okay, let's distribute more nets and, and let's treat people. Uh, all those is, are good things, but it goes back to the education and changing the mindset. Um, 
climate change will happen, floods will happen, a lot of things will continue to happen, but if you have a resilient system, enough education for people to understand what to do, mosquitoes are not the most difficult thing to control. Well, I would say differently when I'm in the field, but now um, it, it's possible to be done. It's just building a resilient system, proper education, and just get ready. The tools are available. And so Jason, what would be your kind of call to action or advice to the people in this room or that are tuning in on how they should be you know, thinking differently about mosquito management, whether they work in health or actually um, you know, in, in broader environmental programs? Uh, it's possible, um, number one. <laughs> it's been shown, um, not recently, not over the last decade, but over the last century, with far less technology and far less money. So as we look to a disease specifically like malaria, this is something that is within our grasp that can be done in our lifetime. This is not a stretch. But the biggest danger for moving forward is our own assumptions. That's really the biggest danger because those assumptions are all anchored in kind of this myopic view of the vector. It, 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 it floods outside, but I have to go into my house and I have to sleep under a net. So, um, I mean, we just need to make sure that we just reset the assumptions. Forget new technologies, forget policy. If you don't reset the assumption and you don't adjust your uh, mindset and your worldview, there's no sense in moving forward. It's, we don't want to be technology centric. We want to be, uh, we want that philosophy. And when that philosophy falls in place, we have all the tools. It's there, it's available. We don't have to wait around for it. And, and that, that's really the call to action is we have the solutions today, so. Excellent, well thank you Jason, thank you Silas, and thank you to Valent Biosciences for partnering with us today. Thank you.